Hello, I'm Dr. Nick Pennings, Chair and Associate Professor of Family Medicine at the Campbell University School of Osteopathic Medicine, and I'm here today with Dr. Joynita Nicholson, a clinical expert and pioneer in bariatric medicine from Richmond, Virginia, who is board certified in obesity medicine and family medicine with fellowship designation in obesity medicine. And today we are going to review the role of anti-obesity medications, or we may refer to them as AOMs, in obesity management. So the first thing I wanted to ask about was how do AOMs fit in a chronic disease approach to obesity management? Thank you, Nick, for that wonderful introduction. And may I start by just saying I am super excited that we are doing this podcast and we actually have medications we can talk about. They're because great. when right, because when I first started taking care of patients with obesity in 2003, I believe it was, um, I really did only have three options and I only felt comfortable prescribing one of those medications, uh, which had been out since 1959. And so all of those at that time were for short-term management. And I'm so thrilled that in this podcast, we're gonna talk more about what these newer options are and um, the successes and hopefully our, our, our listeners will be more comfortable after hearing this podcast. So when we talk about anti-obesity medications or AOMs, they fit into chronic disease approach of obesity management because um, obesity treatment guidelines agree that they're, they're appro the appropriate approach for weight management um, because it should include lifestyle modifications, pharmacotherapy, and or bariatric surgery. So not just one of those items, but it can include all of them at times. And as you and I have been chatting on these podcasts, it really depends on the individual patient. And so that's why it's gonna be so important. You know, after you start nutritional therapy, bring the patient back, make sure you have sufficient follow-up visits. If you initiate the medication therapy, don't just leave them on the medicine and say, I'll see you in a year follow up so we can make sure it is still effective and appropriate. Um, and if surgical intervention is, is needed, then make sure you follow up because sometimes in addition to the surgeries, we do have to add medications and making sure the patients are still on track with the nutritional therapy, um, physical activity and behavioral modifications. None of these entities should be used alone, but rather in concert within the context of a comprehensive approach for optimal health and long-term success. And there is strong evidence that when five to 10% of the weight loss is achieved from the baseline of body weight, that over 237 associated chronic illnesses, which includes COVID-19 at this point, um, improve. Um, it's been shown that the A1Cs and the uh, LDLs and the triglycerides and the HDLs all improve. It's been shown that systolic blood pressures and diastolic blood pressures in patients with hypertension improve. It's been shown that patients who have um, arthritis in their joints are able to be more mobile and active. So all of these things improve when we're able to have that sustained weight loss and medication is what can be helpful in, in allowing to sustain, uh, sustain uh, th this to be sustained. The addition of AOMs also produces a greater weight loss and weight loss maintenance compared with lifestyle interventions alone. And so, you know, Nick, what has been your experience with this? And can you provide an overview of current FDA approved anti-obesity medications? Well, I think you make some great points there, Janita. There's the role of medications can play a very powerful role. Uh, complement to the treatment, to, to the lifestyle changes that are being made when you're treating obesity. And I think it's just important to recognize that when you're treating obesity, you're treating so many of those diseases. You are treating so many of those 237 diseases uh, that are associated with obesity. You're treating the diabetes. You're treating the hypertension. Uh, and I think that's an important concept that uh, sometimes it's referred to uh, as a, obesity is referred to as the mother of all diseases or mother of all those diseases. And it's true. When you're treating that, you're really having a, a broader effect. Uh, when it comes to medications that are approved by the FDA, there are short-term uh, use indications and long-term use indications. Now, for the short-term indications, it's important to recognize that these medications were approved some over 60 years ago. And 
obesity was thought of as a short-term disease. So our understanding of obesity has evolved. So medications like fentermine and fendimetrazine and diethylpropion are medications that are quote unquote approved for short-term use, uh, but really many obesity medicine specialists prescribe them much longer than that. Now it's important to know what your state regulations are because sometimes there are limitations around that, uh, but fortunately some of those regulations are being lifted and are much more in line with our current understanding of obesity treatment. There are a host of medications that are also approved for long-term use. And so uh, fentramine topiramate is a medication uh, made available under the brand name Qsimia, which was approved in 2012. Uh, and I really find this medication to be particularly helpful for those that feel a lot of hunger. Uh, it seems to be very good for particularly appetite uh, suppression, and so that I find to be useful. And one of the other things about this medication is it's approved for as young as 12 years old, so it has a, a pediatric indication. Bupropion naltrexone, sold as Contrave, was approved in 2014, uh, and there too is another medication. What I find this particularly helpful for is for people who have a lot of cravings. It seems to work on some of that reward pathways that people have with foods, and so that can be particularly effective uh, for those patients. The next medication that became available is liraglutide, uh, provided for treating obesity under the name Saxenda, uh, and that medication is a daily injectable and is the first of the GLP-1s to be approved for the treatment of obesity. There's also a medication called setmelanotide or Invemsi, which was approved in 2020. It is uh, has a very narrow indication for age six and above the patients that have specific genetic disorders that are associated with obesity. So it's not something that would be commonly used, but it's important to know that there are genetic conditions that cause obesity and there's specific treatments for some of those. Semaglutide was approved in 2021 and is sold under the name Wegovi. And this also is an injectable GLP-1, but this is a weekly injection, so it's a little bit uh, easier. And also, sometimes referred to as the next generation, the first of the next generation of anti-obesity medications because these are really potent where we're seeing uh, with some aglutide 15% average weight loss, much higher than the other agents. Uh, and now last year, uh, 2023, terzepatide was approved uh, and sold under the name Zepbound. And that is also a weekly injection and that showed an average weight loss of, of over 20%. So it's pretty exciting that we're seeing these particular agents being available in the marketplace and being highly effective for being able to treat obesity. Now, the anti-obesity medications all have a similar indication in that they are indicated for individuals with a BMI of 30 and above uh, or a BMI of 27 and, or above, plus an adiposity-related disease, such as cardiovascular disease, hypertension, obstructive sleep apnea. These are all uh, obesity-related diseases that, um, that lowers the indication down to a BMI of 27. The other thing to remember is that when patients are on these anti-obesity medications, they should, receive, they should achieve a 5% weight loss by 12 weeks on the maximum tolerated dose. And this is an important distinction that sometimes insurance companies will want to assess what their weight loss is at 12 weeks, but you may still be titrating uh, these medications. The, the GLP-1 agonists in particular have a titration schedule that you need to follow that can take two to three, two to four months to be able to titrate out to the full dose. So uh, you want to judge it at 12 weeks and they should lose at least 5% of their uh, weight. And if they haven't, then you really want to think about another medication. It's important to know what your state regulations are regarding prescribing anti-obesity medicines. As I mentioned, uh, some states have strict regulations around that, although many of them are lifting those regulations uh, as we understand the treatment of obesity better. So, Trinita, how do GLP-1 receptor agonists and uh, this dual GIP, GLP-1 receptor agonist, 
differ from some of the traditional anti-obesity medicines used in terms of mechanism of action and, and potential benefits? Yeah. Well, Nick, when you were talking about those medications that were approved by the FDA and have been around for a while, your fentramin, your fendimetrazine, diethylpropion, and there was only one long-acting medication back then that I'd like to just kind of just throw out there, too, and that was Orlistat, right? That was the only long-acting one we had, and it was approved in 1999 by the FDA, and it was for body mass index over 30. And then they allowed that one to be over-the-counter in the form of Ally um, by 2007, and they indicated it for 18 years and older. Um, but I mentioned that because now we have all of these medications that you mentioned from 2012 forward uh, that are long acting and approved for long term use. And that is super exciting because it's like as time goes on, we get better and better with the types of options we have for anti-obesity medications. You know, instead of taking a pill every day, um, we then had an injection that you could take if you didn't like to swallow pills. Instead of taking an injection every day, we now have injections that are weekly options and they're effective. So as time goes on, um, it's my observation that we're getting better and better with the devices, the um, device use, with adherence to these medications because we're having more options and better approaches. So when we specifically look at the GLP-1 receptor agonists and the dual GIP GLP-1 receptor agonists, we're referring to um, the latter ones that you talked about. The liraglutide and semaglutide are the GLP-1 receptor agonists. And then when we look at dual therapy, we're looking at the one that was just um, approved by the FDA, and that's terzepatide. And that's a GLP-1 receptor agonist, as well as it uh, targets GIP. So the AOMs were approved by the FDA for short-term use, and they included the fentramin, fendametrazin, and diethylpropion in order of potency. And when they referred to short-term use back in 1959, which is when uh, fentramin was first approved, they were talking about less than 12 weeks. But we know it's, it's beneficial and it's safe to be used beyond that because it now is included in the Qsemia or the um, fentramin and topiramid combination peel. So just know that's the same medication, it's just in a smaller dosage. Um, so it is safe. They are oral preparations that are sympathomimetic amine derived, and they're thought to produce an anorectic or appetite suppressing effect by releasing norepinephrine that acts through alpha-1 adrenetic receptors in the paraventricular nucleus in the central nervous system to reduce the food intake. And some patients also experience a stimulant effect when they use this family of medicine and a long-term reduction of carbohydrate cravings with their use. They are categorized as Schedule four controlled substances and can be used in ages 16 with no upper limit according to the age to be used safely, without abuse, without addiction, without withdrawal, and uh, no evidence of heart valvular disease. A newer generation of anti-obesity medications approved by the FDA for long-term treatment of obesity are a single agent self-administered subcutaneous injection and this includes your liraglutide, which is a daily dose that has been approved for 12 years and older. Semaglutide 2.4, which is a weekly dose that has been approved for 12 years and older. And they are the GLP-1 RAs or the glucagon-like peptide 1 receptor agonists. They're also known as incretins. They're also known as nutrient-stimulated hormones. And they mimic action of a hormone called glucagon-like peptide 1, a hormone that is made by the intestine with several roles, including it triggers release of insulin from the pancreas, it blocks glucagon secretion to prevent more glucagose from going into the bloodstream, and when an individual eats, blood sugar levels start to rise, and it activates GLP-1 receptors in the pancreas to stimulate the body to produce more insulin, known as the incretin effect. And um, once we see this endocrine effect, the extra insulin helps lower blood sugar levels and allows the body to use the food uh, we eat for energy. 
This GLP-1 receptor agonist also helps curb hunger by slowing the digestion and the movement of food out of the stomach and into the small intestines. And this is referred to as delayed gastric emptying. This helps patients feel full faster and longer so they eat less. GLP-1 receptor agonists additionally affect areas of the brain um, that processes hunger and satiety or fullness, and it causes a reduction of food intake, hunger, appetite. So these combined effects result in weight loss. Studies have found that all GLP-1 medications can lead to weight loss of about 10.5 to 15.8 pounds, when using loraglutide, and studies have found that when using semaglutide and making lifestyle changes, they lost about 33.7 pounds um, versus 5.7 pounds for those who did not use the medication. And that's approximately 15% um, weight loss. And so other benefits of semaglutide include it improves the blood pressure. We've seen lots of articles about that now. Um, and the cardiovascular doctors are jumping on board to utilize it. Um, it in improves lipids, glycemic control, bone density, cardiovascular disease, polycystic ovarian syndrome, infertility, alcohol addiction, alcohol use disorder, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, chronic kidney disease, Alzheimer's, cystic fibrosis, and COVID-19. And there are more and more articles coming out where science is now supporting that this GLP-1 medication has been found to be beneficial in so many other areas of health, although they're not approved yet for those areas by the FDA. So stay tuned. We'll have to see um, what holds in our new near future. The most recent anti-obesity medication approved by the FDA for long-term management of weight is a first of its kind. It's a dual agent, self-administered weekly subcutaneous injection called trizapatide. And Nick has already given us a wonderful intro to it. It is safe and effective for 18 years and older. It works by targeting two receptors, both are digestive incretin hormones, and they are the GLP-1 receptor agonists and GIP, which stands for glucose-dependent insulinotropic polypeptide. And these will stimulate greater effect on the glucose, as well as gastric emptying and brain signaling to feel full, resulting in greater weight reduction. Weight loss has been shown to be more than 20% mean weight loss in people without diabetes type 2 when we use terzepatide. So Nick, terzepatide was recently approved by the FDA. Can you discuss the clinical significance of this approval and how terzepatide differs from other GLP-1 receptor agonists? So Joynita, the development of these GLP-1 receptor agonists has really been a very exciting therapeutic contribution to not just diabetes, but now to obesity. And we can see all these additional beneficial effects with these agents and how it's impacting not just the hunger, but also even the desire to eat in some ways and really having an, a number of pleiotropic effects that really benefit patients. And the GEIP receptor agonist really adds another dimension to this. It's referred to as a twin crin, but because it has dual uh, incretin activities affecting both GIP and GLP-1 receptors. And so like GLP-1, these agents are going to decrease appetite and improve glucose control by increasing glucose-dependent insulin production. And that is also thought to have a benefit on the survival of the beta cell. The GIP also has some unique effects, though, and actually, if you look at GIP by itself, you wouldn't think that it would be beneficial. So there's some sort of synergy that is going on by stimulating these two receptors, because GIP actually increases glucagon production, which you think would not be helpful, um, but it, it is. It doesn't raise sugar because it's balanced by the GLP-1 effect. It increases adipogenesis, so it increases the formation of uh, adipocytes or fat cells. Uh, and you wouldn't think that would be beneficial, but again, if you're eating less, uh, having more 
fat cells actually can be beneficial from a health point of view because there's more room to expand uh, if any excess calories are consumed. So there is a, a benefit that is seen with that. And it improves blood flow to those adipocytes. And that is one of the things that we see when adipocytes, when fat cells become overloaded, when they're too full, that is when we're going to see inflammation and inflammatory changes with the productions of cytokines and, uh, and unhealthy adipokines that are going to contribute to the disease processes of obesity. And so when we can decrease these inflammation and adipocytes with these agents, we're seeing other benefits as well. And GIP increases bone density. I'm not sure what the clinical benefits of that are, but it seems to be another positive effect. So these agents have similar side effects, though. They're typically gastrointestinal side effects that we see with the terzepatide, that we see with the GLP-1 agonist, although in my experience, I find that patients tend to have fewer of the uh, reflux symptoms that can be associated with these agents. So they, I find them to be a little bit better tolerated. Uh, it is something that you're going to gradually increase the dose of. There's a whole titration schedule uh, around that. But I think those different pathways, those different effects uh, are going to enhance the uh, uh, weight loss effect, and we see a greater weight loss effect, but also uh, improve the tolerability of these agents. So what factors should primary care clinicians be considering when they're deciding whether to prescribe a new anti-obesity medication to their patients with obesity? When these clinicians are considering whether to start an anti-obesity medication in their patients, it's important, as we both mentioned throughout this series, to take that great historical, just, um, uh, uh, you've, you've got to go back and get the patient's history, not just their medical history, but I would encourage you to get to know their weight loss or weight management history. You know, have they participated in other programs before? Have they tried other medications? And so just make sure you understand who you're dealing with here so that you can have a good place to start. But be aware that anti-obesity medications should be used in combination with a comprehensive lifestyle intervention. So it's not going to be sufficient for a patient to come in and say, hey, doc, you know, I want this medication. You know, can you prescribe it for me? And their body mass index is not over 30 or at least over 27, you know, with an associated weight condition. Uh, so, you know, just, just know that it's, it's to be used in combination. You've got to have the appropriate patient, the right patient for this, and be aware that one size does not fit all. You know, just because a previous patient might have had great success with this particular medication does not guarantee that the next patient will have that type of same success. And so that's why it's important to bring the patients back for follow-up so you can document, is the medication working? Um, is the patient tolerating it? Well, because if they're not tolerating it, they're not going to take it as prescribed. Um, you might have to make some modifications, uh, but you also want to do it in a safe way. And uh, so one size does not fit all. And, and one patient's success does not dictate another patient's success. But each can be successful if they're on the appropriate medication. It is important to take a good medical history to learn the patient's health conditions, medications, weight loss journey, and goals, and be aware of the indications, contraindications, and the adverse drug reactions of the medications, as well as the benefits of the medications, the availability, and the proper device use. And it's so, so super important to make sure if you're going to use one of the injectables, make sure you demonstrate how to use the device correctly. Otherwise, uh, there are some reports that there are overdoses of semaglutide, and that's because um, it's, it's being understood that sometimes patients are not uh, utilizing the entire dosage of medication, and so they're doubling up or they're trying to use excess and then um, use whatever their next dose is. So just make sure education is so, so important when we're using anti-obesity medicine uh, so that we can prevent any uh, problems like that. And we want to share this information with the patient. And we want to partner with them to choose the right medication that will best be tolerated, most affordable, most accessible, most appropriate, most effective for that particular patient. For instance, if a patient with obesity already is experiencing gastroparesis, they will not be the best candidate to utilize GLP-1 receptor agonists. 
Another thing to consider is it's a good thing to choose a medication that can provide a patient with more than one benefit. So if they have diabetes, GLP-1 RAs are excellent because they'll get the benefit of lowering the A1C. And we're finding now the cardiovascular benefits and so forth. We want to be diligent to routinely follow up, as I've stated, um, with that patient after an AI, AOM is initiated uh, to evaluate effectiveness of the medication and assess how the patient is tolerating the medication before you advance to any new doses. And if the patient is not achieving clinically significant weight loss or medication, um, is not tolerated well, um, or the patient starts to regain weight, then this can be a reason to discontinue the medication and consider a trial of a different medication with continued lifestyle intervention. Finally, I want us to remember, we must be aware of the support systems that are in place for the patients and the clinicians um, when we're dealing with obesity management and to tap into them, utilize them. Um, if, if you as a clinician are not comfortable prescribing anti-obesity medications, you have several resources so you can increase your knowledge by attending CMEs and podcasts like this. Um, and Nick has mentioned many other resources available. You too can become board certified in obesity medicine if you have that interest. So just know that you know, there are a lot of support systems available. There are a lot of resources available um, and they can be used in addition to the medications to help patients achieve overall success. So Nick, how can primary care clinicians help to manage some of the common adverse effects associated with anti-obesity medication. Well, thanks, Janita. I think you made some great points in your last comment that while the indication for treating obesity is based on a BMI, it's a lot more complicated than that, and you really need to individualize that approach. And part of that individualization is understanding what other conditions they have and what other medications they're on. And so if patients have diabetes and they're on agents that lower glucose uh, by increasing insulin, which would include utilizing exogenous insulin or sulfonylureas or metaglitinides, those agents increase insulin production, and so some of these agents can cause you to become hypoglycemic when used in combination with those agents. So you're going to want to decrease and sometimes uh, take patients off of those medications when you're prescribing these agents. Another thing to think about is when patients are losing weight, uh, their blood pressure often improves. In fact, it can go down dramatically, and as a result, uh, they could become hypotensive uh, if they're on blood pressure medications. So you want to titrate those blood pressure medications down and even discontinue them if their blood pressure is getting too low. So have your patients monitor their blood pressure and see them regularly. I would say the, the most common side effects that we're seeing with the GLP-1s and the GIP GLP-1s are gastrointestinal. We're seeing increasing amounts of reflux. We see nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, or constipation. And so there's some strategies that you can utilize to try to minimize those side effects. You can slow the titration process as the symptoms are typically transient. So if you stay at a particular dose a little bit longer, they tend to resolve and a patient tolerates future increases better. Um, if the side effects are too severe, uh, then you can either pause the medication or sometimes just treat those symptoms, uh, utilizing something for the diarrhea or constipation or the nausea uh, on a short-term basis to help the patient get to that point of tolerability. Also, make sure they stay hydrated. You want sometimes when their people are not hungry, they're also not thinking about drinking. Uh, and so you want to make sure that they're keeping hydrated uh, with water, as we talked about before, that uh, drinking plenty of water. And if a patient develops abdominal pain on these, it's, it may be the medication, but also if a patient has a gallbladder and they're losing a significant amount of weight, we want to monitor for cholecystitis and make sure that they don't develop an acute gallbladder problem. Dietary modification can help as well by eating smaller portions uh, that are better tolerated. You want to limit fat in the diet as high fat meals can cause more nausea on the GLP-1 agonists and limit fire, uh, not too spicy. Uh, that too can increase reflux symptoms as well as eating slower. By eating slower, uh, we can get that sense of fullness earlier and avoid overeating. 
Another thing that we want to make sure of is our patients are eating enough calories uh, that when patients are taking these agents, sometimes it suppresses hunger so much they'll go most of the day without eating. Uh, and you want to make sure that they're eating regularly throughout the day. And here the quality of the nutrients becomes really important. So you want to prioritize protein first, then vegetables, then other foods. You want to make sure you're meeting your protein needs, typically 1.2 to 1.6 grams of protein per kilogram of ideal body body weight per day. And then also think about vitamin and mineral supplementation when they're on these agents uh, to make sure that they're getting the essential vitamins and minerals. So let me ask you, uh, Jonita, what are some anti-obesity medications that are on the horizon for obesity management and how do they differ from the currently available medications? Oh, this is an incredibly exciting area of medicine because it gives us promise. Promise that it is going to be a continued emphasis placed on obesity management. Um, and it's our hope, right, that they will eventually become not only uh, a greater menu of options, but also more affordable for our patients and uh, more accessible to the patients in need. But how exciting to know that we will at some point have uh, an oral GLP-1 receptor agonist available. Uh, it is currently on trial. Right now we have an oral GLP-1 receptor agonist, but it is indicated for diabetes. And so now we're looking at having an oral one for weight management. It's exciting that there are also more dual and triple agonists, or shall we say additional pathways for obesity to be treated. This is all on the horizon. Um, and uh, there also, I came across information where uh, monoclonal antibodies are, are being studied and uh, with the hope that they will be infused to help increase muscle mass while decreasing fat. So there, there are a lot of really good items um, in our box uh, that are in trial studies now. They have not been approved by the FDA, but it's really super exciting to know that obesity is now finally being looked at more as what it is, and that is an endocrine disease uh, rather than something that is a lifestyle choice or something that a patient did to himself or herself. Um, and we have better options and more personalized treatments uh, that are available and becoming available. So Nick, how, how, how super exciting to be alive during this time when this is happening. Absolutely. I think this is a really exciting uh, time for us and it's really great to be able to participate with you in this podcast. I see really a, a huge shift in opportunities with these high-potency anti-obesity medicines. I think it's important for our listeners to know that we need to manage nutrition effectively with these medications, though, make sure people are getting the proper nutrition, uh, that these medications treat the normal physiologic hunger that we get when we calorie restrict, and it's not a good feeling. We even have a, a name for it. We call it hangry. Uh, and so we counter that with these medications, and we need to do it long term because obesity is a long-term chronic disease. If you're not comfortable treating obesity, then refer to obesity medicine specialists. But I'm hoping that primary care providers will be more and more comfortable with treating this disease. You know, it's what I see as primary care being the first-line treatment of obesity, and I think that will be pivotal. Our patients need it. We see obesity rates continuing to rise, and we need everybody to be participating in the treatment of this disease. So we hope you find this information helpful. To obtain your CME credit, please visit the primed.com and complete a short post assessment. If you listen to this podcast on another platform, please refer to the episode description where there's a direct link to the activity page on primed.com for claiming CME credit. Thank you so much for listening to this PriMed podcast and have a great day. Thank you, Nick.